Kaczynski from the Government Accountability Office is here. He's been there for a long time. He previously was the controller for GAO. He's also directed housing and telecommunications. He's worked in community development and environmental protection issues, all for GAO. And before that, he was with the um, Congressional Research Service, which I would love to say is a great resource for journalists, but not. Oh. Uh, that's the research service that works for Congress. And if you can get your uh, congressional sources to give you their reports, their terrific reports, but they won't give them to you directly. Um, and also for the Congressional Budget Office. So Stan is going to, um, again, pull back a little bit from the details and really talk about um, states and local governments and, uh, and some of their issues today. So Stan, I'll turn it over great. to you. Thanks so much. Great, great. Th thanks, Linda. Um, it's a pleasure being here today. Um, you know, I was looking at the groups that sponsor this, and GAO has had affiliations with, with everybody uh, that's putting this together. Uh, I was telling Linda that the model that I'm going to talk about to start off today, we rolled it out uh, through the National Press Club and, and because of our relationship there. And the Regional Reporters Association, typically folks come by and chat with us and we just sort of tell them some of the things that are on their mind. In Indiana University, we actually have students in our, our, who now work for us who came through the program, so they're now GAO folks. Uh, and then Politico, I mean, I, I don't need to say more about that. Um, also, getting a chance to talk to journalists um, is, to me, is a personal honor. And uh, I, I really appreciate the kind of work journalists do because, for one, you complement what we do at GAO. You help us get our message out there. We very much appreciate that. Uh, I don't know how much you know about GAO, so I'm going to spend a moment or two and just tell you a little bit about us. Uh, we are in the congressional uh, branch of government. Uh, Linda mentioned CBO, CRS, where I worked. I, I've worked in every congressional uh, research agency. And uh, what we do is we look at issues at the request of Congress primarily. We put out reports and we make recommendations. But we have no ability to enforce anything. So it's the work that many of you do getting our message out there that builds public uh, perceptions and, and interest. And as a result, about 80% of the recommendations we make get implemented. Um, so and, and a lot of the credit goes to the you folks. And, and I also think that we're, in some respects we're kindred souls because at GAO we get an issue, we do some research on it, and we put out a report. And that's essentially what you folks do, except you do it a lot quicker than us. It takes us about a year. <laughs> so if, if it took you about a year, you wouldn't be sitting here today because you'd be out of jobs. <laughs> um, on CRS, uh, it is interesting what Linda mentioned, CRS does do a much quicker turnaround, but it is t typically is directed and it's for the members of Congress. So you're right, it's hard to get a hold of this stuff. In terms of GAO, whatever we put out, except for those that are classified, they're on our web. And I, and I will close with... Uh, giving you the citations to our website. Uh, today what I want to do is to do something I hope that complements what Bill did. Uh, the Sunlight Foundation and places like that, like OMB Watch, etc., are tremendous resources and, and I'd urge you to take advantage of them. Uh, we do, as Mecca does tell them, Bill, that one of the jobs I'm going to talk about today, one of the stops we have is talking to Sunlight because they're a tremendous research uh, tool. What I want to do though is step back and give you sort of an overview, a satellite view of the federal interactions with the state and local governments. Uh, when you're talking about state and local governments, <coughs> you're really talking in some respects about a part of policy that is not thought about that much in Washington. We tend to think about things in Washington down, down the programmatic line, so somebody might think about something as an education issue or a housing issue or whatever. But in reality, those issues play out by who provides the services. And very, very few services are provided directly by the federal government. I, I remember one time I got myself into trouble uh, talking to a reporter uh, and he, when I was doing housing work and he was saying, well, what does HUD do? And I had the statement, HUD doesn't do anything. And then, <laughs> and then I went on to explain that what HUD does, it gives money, it guarantees loans, it works with others to carry out the policies. But the quote that got picked up was, I doesn't do anything. <laughs> which, which made me a real unpopular guy the next time I went over to Hyde to talk to you. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's 
all's fair. <laughs> but, but, but the point is, is that much of federal policy is carried out at the state and local level and with nonprofits. And it's a very big driver of the success, not only policy, but also of the economy as a whole. About one in every six jobs are at the state and local level. And you talk about that share of GDP. So when you're thinking about things like the downturn and the stimulus, the, the Recovery Act is what we call it, a lot of that money went through state and local governments because that is a very strong driver of not only policy, but economic well-being. What I want to do today is start off by walking you through a model that GAO built of the state and local government. We look out 50 years. Uh, and it's the only model there is of its kind like this. Uh, I want to then complement that with a look back 30 years, and you can see the trends look very, very different. So I'm hoping to give you some targets of opportunity to think about. Uh, also, some themes that you might want to consider. It may be a couple tools, but, I, but to be honest, the people coming before and after me will be better at the tools. What I'd also like to do is ask you to interrupt me at any time with anything. Uh, these kind of discussions work best if you engage with me and tell me, hey, I think that's nonsense, or I don't understand it, or I wanted you to talk about this, and, and, and don't worry, I, I'll handle it. Don't, don't feel bad at me. So, so I'd like to do that if you're okay with it. On the model that we built, the state and local sector, it took us probably three or four years to essentially model what goes on in terms of revenues and expenditures. And I'm going to give you a very simple overview of it. Uh, but, it does, but that's what it is. It's revenues and expenditures. So it's what money comes into the state and local governments and what goes out what it goes out for, and who it comes in from. Now what you see there in front of you is a line heading down. And what you'd rather see is a line heading up. Uh, that is what we project as the fiscal pressures that state and local governments will be facing over the next 50 years. Now, now a couple caveats I want to be really clear on. At GAO, we follow the federal money. So we, it's very important to us what happens to the sector and the people and how they use it. We do not evaluate performance by individual states or localities. So if somebody asks me, well, how's Indiana doing or how's this, I can't tell you because that's not what we do. If you ask us how HUD is doing or how environment is doing, that we can talk about. But a lot of what HUD and environment are doing have to do with how well the states and local governments work in general. So one thing I want to, to key you to is to be thinking about, and this is something that Bill talked about, is the recipients of grants. To follow who gets it and what they do with it and what their capacity is. And what this first graph shows you is that unless major changes are made, the capacity of state and local governments is going to be stressed. Now, what that says is that there's a growing imbalance between money coming in and what would be going out under current policies. Now you know that unlike the federal government, state and local governments have to balance their budgets. So you're never going to see this actual level of deficit. But what you're going to see is stress in the sector. And the point that we make globally is that if you look at the earlier part of the line, it's smaller. The quicker you address it with fundamental structural changes, the quicker uh, you'll get to a solution. To let it go, it's going to be harder to address. So what I want to do is to walk you through a little bit about some of the revenues and expenditures. And again, I think these have some targets and they'd be to think about. Sure. Could you just say again, what exactly is going down and what is this chart saying? What this is saying is that if you don't make changes, let's see, we're going to try out the pointer. If you don't make changes, up here you're seeing the sector being pretty much in balance. I mean, the amount of money that's coming into it is about the amount they're spending. And what you're seeing is over time, unless there are changes in the amount that comes in or the amount they spend, this sector is not going to be fiscally viable. That's so it, what, what this is showing is a, essentially a meltdown of state and local governments if we don't make some changes. Does that, does that get at your point? Can I ask you sure. for a clarification? For sure, me? sure. Um, when you say money coming in, you said you are only following the federal part of it. So does that mean that this line does not represent 
state income taxes, state sales tax, that kind of thing. What exactly is included? Oh, <laughs> I paid her to ask that question <laughs> to show that we're on the same, on the same page. Uh, GAO will only follow the federal money coming into the sector because that's what our charter is. But the health of state local governments is going to be dependent not just on federal money, but on their own source revenues. So the very first chart that I want to talk about is looking at own source revenues. If you're looking at state and local governments, the major places that they raise money on their own are in three places. They have income taxes, they have sales taxes, and they have property taxes. And there's a story with each one of those. On, on the income taxes, the, what states typically do is they will mirror what federal, the federal government does. As a matter of fact, they will use the, the US code and then just put in different percentages. So what the federal government does on its taxes, the state governments will usually do. And this becomes a challenge to state governments because what happens is the federal government makes changes like at the last minute, and the states don't know quite how to forecast some of this stuff. With the federal government, it's not as big a deal because if you make a last minute change and your deficit's a little more or less, you just print more or less money. But if you're in a state government and you've got to balance your budget, it means last minute changes in your spending because your revenues have changed, because the federal government made a change that you had no say over. So one thing to watch in the state governments is their revenue projections, to watch them at the time when the year is gonna be ending and see how close to balance they are. And what will then happen is if they're not in balance, they've got to make themselves in balance. And they can either do that by cutting or they sometimes do it through smoke and mirrors. Uh, an, an example of smoke and mirrors typically will happen sometimes in the pensions. In, in state and local pensions, and this is something that I'm going to talk about a little bit later, because one of the stresses we're seeing right now, there are three major drivers. It's what you, what you have in your reserves and what it's earning you, what you're paying out in benefits, and what you're getting in contributions. And a lot of that's driven by assumptions. So if you're at the state level and you're looking at the end of the year budgets, and you're seeing a change in their forecast of revenues, that means they've got a problem. They probably can't cut actual expenses that as much. They will look for some place that they can do something and say, well, let's look at our pensions. I think we're gonna make more money this year on our portfolio. Oh, we're balanced. So, so those are some targets for you to look at. And there are states that have gotten into trouble with that. Uh, for example, Illinois, uh, New Jersey are states that have problems with their pension plans because of some of those. California is another example. So that, that's a target for you to look at. The, the next line that I want to talk about for a second is the, uh, the sales tax. And if you notice in the sales tax, we show that line declining over 50 years. As a share of, of GDP, sales tax revenues we show being down over a 50 year simulation period. And, and there's one word for that, the internet. It was, it was interesting, I was up in Philadelphia back in June and we were talking about state and local fiscal issues as a task force put together. And uh, Bill Clinton came in and talked to us. And uh, we asked, we had asked before he came in to, to cover certain issues and one of them was this. And, and Clinton made the point and he was up there and said, it's internet sales is what driving the, the because they're not taxed, is what's hurting the state income taxes. And our state, our state sales tax, I apologize. And he said that was a decision that he made when he was president, because if you think back when the, that, was, that was, the internet sales weren't that big and he wanted to stimulate them. And now we have a totally different world. So one thing to look at is what goes on over the next number of years for state governments to capture as much as they can of those internet sales. And, and that's, that, that to me is gonna determine the success of that revenue source. The third one is property taxes. And, and property taxes is sort of an interesting story because when the recession hit, as you know, this recession was housing driven. So property values are down and we expected to see property tax revenues down. And it took until just now, frankly, to finally see that dip. Uh, so this is one of those cases where I was talking to people saying, 
you know, if you've got an uh, if you have a revenue stream that's going to be under siege, it's going to be property taxes because that's the genesis of, of the recession. And for year one, for year two, for year three, I was wrong. And then thank God, <laughs> it finally collapsed. <laughs> 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 I'll, I'll tell you an, another sort of funny story, um, and that is when we put out our model, the first year we did it was 2007, and we got it out there, and we said, we think it works good, we, we talked to a lot of different people, and we thought that it would be a good simulation. 2008 came and we were updating, and our model took this big dive, and I'm like, oh no, you know, this is like the summer of 2008. And the, the economist is sitting with us and I said, you know, this, is, this, this line is like dropping off the, the bottom of the charts here. We have something wrong with our model. I wouldn't let them publish it. I said, you've got to go back and talk to all the people again and redo it. They went back, they talked to everybody, we did it. And then they said, it's what it shows. And so we, we said, okay, we'll put out the model and see what happens. And thank God the recession hit. So, um, what, what, was, what was actually happening? And, and that's the, and that, that one I don't, you know, don't quote me on, thank God, this session. <laughs> 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 that's worse than the HUD story. <laughs> uh, but, but what it was is our model was picking up leading indicators of stress. And then, as you know, the financial markets collapsed. We, were, we actually were in recession, and it wasn't declared yet. Because when you do recessions, you have to go back to have so many quarters. So our model is actually picking up what was happening. We just didn't know it yet. Uh, so, um, so that so that's to me what turned out was bad news for everybody else, but good news for our models. Now, on the on the other side of the coin, on state and local uh, fiscal condition, is where they spend the money, and this is a really simple story, and it's going to lead very well into your next speaker. Uh, if there is one place where you can affect state and local fiscal health, it's health care. And that you can get everything else right and you get health care wrong and, and the, the sector is going to be in big trouble. And you can pretty much get health care right and everything else sort of wrong and still hang in there. Uh, I cannot overstate the importance of health care to state and local governments. And it really comes in two components, Medicaid, and then what the state and local governments pay for their own employees and their own retirees. Uh, the Medicaid story is tied in with health care reform. Because as you know, that with health care reform, one of the major pieces for universal coverage is using expanded Medicaid coverage. And, and this one is going to be a fascinating story. Uh, this one will play out differently at each state. This is where I'd urge you to look at the individual states you cover and see what they are doing for Medicaid expansion. Uh, we put out a report about a year ago looking at states' plans. And uh, the, the bottom line is, is that I, I don't know how much you know about health care reform with Medicaid expansion, but the bottom line is, is that for the next several years, 100% of the expanded eligibility costs will be picked up by the federal government. And then over time, it'll phase down to about 90% of the additional costs will be picked up by the federal government. So the federal government has a very big share in this, but states will have some down the road. But the, if you turn back to a year ago during the uh, Supreme Court decision, the only piece of health care reform that really wasn't upheld was the federal requirement that states expand their Medicaid. They're allowed to, and it will be funded, but they aren't required to anymore. So this is going to be a very interesting to see who expands and who doesn't. And the various pressures that go on there are, are fascinating. Because if you're a state and you're not expanding, then you have a pressure from those who are not going to get covered that would have. You also have hospitals who would be having patients come in who would get reimbursed, but now come in and are not. But you also have the longer term perspective of saying, well, down the road, I am going to have to pay more. So it's a balancing act. And, and the states have had different calculus on this one. And it, it divides, well, you can look at the maps and figure it out for yourself how it divides. So I'll let somebody who's, I'll, I'll, I'll let the next speaker talk about that rather than geo-pining. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
you can, you can figure that one out. But watch the health care reform and watch what goes on with Medicaid because that is the biggest share. The other piece I mentioned on health care is when states pay for the cost for their employees and their retirees. Um, the bigger question there is on how they budget for their retirees. Uh, there's a thing called OPEB, which is the benefits that go out. And the questions go on right, on right now. This is the, the accountants are like really into this stuff. And I, I'm not an accountant, so I'm not really good at explaining it. But the bottom line is, do you pay for the stuff up front? Or do you pay for it later? Or do you pay as you go? And there's different ways of doing it. And it's how you account for the liabilities. So these are different areas to look at. Uh, but the one that's the real big one that I can't stress too much is watch the Medicaid story. That's going to really determine what happens with states and with their fiscal condition. Down the road, the other piece of the Medicaid one before I change the next topic is to think about what's going to happen with cost containment because you know providers can reimburse a certain, a certain level depending on which kind of insurance or whatever you have. So there's a lot of dynamics going on there that hasn't shaken out yet. And that's the one that we're watching the most closely in our model going forward long term, because that's going to really drive things. What I want to do now is to take a look back for a second and to talk a little bit about the various sources of funding that come into the state governments. Now, we talked about some of their own source, their income taxes, their sales taxes, their property taxes. Do you notice anything different about these lines looking back 30 years to the ones I had going forward for 50? Let's see what that is. And if you go back, go forward. Sales tax is going down. Yeah. Yeah. Your, your slopes are opposites. So if you're talking about a sector that's stressed naturally going forward, just think about where they've been the last 30 years. They've been doing things based on increasing revenues. And yet what we're projecting going forward is decreasing revenues. It's bad enough to decrease off a of flat base, but off of growing expectations. So this, this, what this says is there's a disconnect going on there. So the 30 year look back and the 50 year look forward show a real dissonance in what goes on with revenues. Now the one that I want to speak about the most is federal grants. Look at that one. The biggest single source of money to state and local governments is the federal government. And that varies by state. So what I would urge you to look at there is within the state what they're doing, within parts of the state. Let's pick on Virginia for a second. Now, Virginia has a very heavy reliance on federal funding. Uh, and the, the reliance is pocketed primarily in two areas, northern Virginia, around D.C., and down the Tidewater area, with a very large military presence. If you don't see the same kind of lines going forward, and you guys have heard about sequestration and all those kind of things, uh, that's going to be a big drag on state revenues, particularly in certain states, particularly in certain areas. So if you're covering stories to watch, because this, I'm trying to give some certain targets to, to think about, and that's what, and watch what they're doing to prepare for it. And I'll stay on Virginia for a second. In Virginia, one of the things they've done is states generally have what they call rainy day funds, essentially reserves that they set aside. So they say if we get a bad, bad situation, we want to draw on our rainy day funds. So for example, when the state, when we went into recession, the states actually had about three quarters of a year extra money built up in their rainy day funds, and that carried them through until you got the Recovery Act money coming in. Uh, and then states actually held their own during the recession, primarily for those two things. Uh, so if you have some stressors coming down the road, you want to build up some reserves. So one thing Virginia's done is they've set up a separate reserve fund saying, we think there's going to be less federal money coming in, and we're going to try to be, have some contingencies for it. States are very protective of their uh, bond ratings, and they do a lot of budgeting with that in mind. And, and having reserves is one of the things they do. So, so one thing to track is how much federal money is going into the states. And I guarantee it's not going to be that line going forward. Now we're down at the local level. Same story over the last 30 years, which we know is a different story over the uh, 
next 50 years. And the only difference is that top line is called state grants. What that is, is primarily federal money. Uh, federal government does what they call pass-throughs. So they will give the money to the states, will give it to the locality. So essentially, this is a mirror image at the local level of what you have at the, at the, at the state level. Same stressors. So what that means is that, in one respect, it's easier to address because you can address the same thing, but it's also vulnerability because now what you have is the exact same revenue sources. This one, you know, I think I date myself on this one. I call this the Pac-Man chart. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, so, I think people, some people are too young to understand Pac-Man. <laughs> this is what we look at is where the federal money is going, what's it going for. And it doesn't take a, a rocket scientist to see that healthcare is just eating up the federal money. That's which combines with my chart earlier about this. So again, you have mirror images going on here of healthcare expenditures going up and the federal money for healthcare consuming more and more of the federal share of spending. So it's crowding out everything else. And there's some really interesting stories that go around the crowding out. So you start with income security. That one's called welfare reform. Back in the Clinton administration, we went from welfare to workfare, and that keyed a reduction in the amount of money going into income security. So if you're looking for targets or vulnerabilities <coughs> for where, if we continue to have increasing health care expenditures, where it's going to be hit next. Well, that's probably not it because we've already done that one. Then look at some of those others like economic affairs, and general public services and like that. They're, they're shrunk down to very, very little. But that is a paradigm shift. Back earlier, there was a concept that money would go to state and local governments for general purposes. Remember revenue sharing? That essentially was a check to the federal government and to state and local government saying, here, we think you know what you're doing, do what you need with it, run your business. Right now, what we have is that money is being replaced by grants for very specific purposes with very specific requirements. So we've already consumed that piece. This is the amount of federal dollars. This, this is the pie chart of how federal grants are broken up. Yes. They filter down. Yes, exactly. This is the. This is the. Oops. I should, 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 should. This is that okay. top line right there what that's going for, what they're doing for, what they're doing. So there are certain targets within there for you folks to be thinking about. So if you think about areas, if we're saying that healthcare is consuming more, income security, we've already taken a bite there. Well, we've already cut this down. You're not going to get much more than that. What's left? Education. If, if I was covering state and local government issues for the press, I'd be watching education really closely. Edu it just the fiscal pressure is driving there. Uh, I'm not talking policy issues. I've, I've never done education work. But if I was there, I'd watch what's going on in education. Education has two major components, as you probably know, in the state and local governments. Primarily at the state level, you're talking about higher ed. At the local governments, primarily K through 12. Higher ed is what I call a shock absorber. Uh, when you have a recession, when you have revenues turning down, the state government says, we're going to put less money into higher ed, i.e., tuitions are going to go up, and we'll, we'll get through this. They typically do some cuts on higher ed. They typically reduce some of their funding for infrastructure. Oh, we won't repave the roads as quickly. Those are temporary <coughs> things. What I'm talking about, though, is long-term structural stress. That's Higher ed's not going to carry you through that. It's, K through 12 is way bigger than, than higher ed. It's probably about four or five times the size of spending for higher ed. Uh, this is going to be a K through 12 issue. Is that the most recent year for which data is available? You know, you must be my controller general because the question he asked me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we, we put this on our web and he's like, 2010? You guys have to have something more recent than that. <laughs> uh, it actually is. Uh, we're going to be updating this fall. What we do is we use census data. And it generally is a couple year lag. So 2011 will be up probably within the next couple of months. But right now, yes. Yeah. 
and, and it won't change. We've, we've already seen the previews. I mean, this, 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 is, this is not a river rushing. This is more glacial. But, but, but it's, 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 it's a story that, that makes you want to consider. Watch the K-12 story. Just, uh, what's the name of this report? Or is that uh, the source on the bottom? Is that the name? Yeah, actually, what we have is two things. Um, we put out an update. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll, let me jump ahead for a second, please. Um, what, what you want to do to get our work, this is our report itself. But also on our website, uh, what we do is we have graphics like you have right here. Uh, and because a lot of people want to reproduce our graphics, we actually have all the plot points. So if, if you, like I, I know USA Today, for example, likes to take some of our graphics. And we just put out the plot points and let people put them back up. So the, the sources for it are the report, which is an update of our model. Then we have the graphics, which are the, the models the 50 year look forward. The graphics are the 30 year look back, which are also there. And those are just up there for anybody to take. Does, does that get at your question? Okay? Yeah. So let's let's go on to that sort of talks about the, the edu what I call the education story. If you look at what's gone on in the past 30 years, oops, sorry. this line here, public welfare, that's a bit of a misnomer. That's because going back to your question, our source is census, and they call public welfare includes Medicaid. So that that's healthcare, really. Even though even though it says healthcare down here, the healthcare down here is is the the ones for the employees. This is the Medicaid line. We use their terms because it's their data. Uh, but education, if you look at the tremendous increase in expenditures in education, at a time when we're saying education may be squeezed going forward, again, it, it's that same story about different views looking back and forward. At the, at the local level, it's even more dramatic. I mean, most of your property taxes go to funding education. So if I, if I had a target looking forward, it would be an education area. What, what I want to do, too, is um, talk a little bit about a couple of themes that, um, that somewhat tie into this. One is on transparency. Another is on grant reform. Uh, but before I do, are there more questions or comments or, or whatever on, on state and local fiscal? I just, again, on the the Pac-Man chart that you have. <laughs> the economic affairs, is that, um, is that like a business development or what, what falls under the category of economic affairs? Um, in, in economic affairs, if I'm not mistaken, that includes such things as what used to be like a program they used to call it UDAG, which was Urban Development Action Grants, which is now gone. Uh, it's, a, it's things like CDBG, uh, and some of those kind of things. It's, it's, it's economic development type issues. And again, I'm not real strong on some of the definitions, uh, but those will be all posted on our site. Um, because these are all percentages, it might be a little um, misleading, perhaps, uh, maybe not. Uh, the total amount of federal grants has gone way up, as we've seen, right? Dollar figures, huge increase. Um, is it that these other areas are being shrunk, or is it just that the rate of growth of that new money is so much shifted to health that they get dwarfed out? In other words, yeah, have they already made cuts and squeezes, or are they still generally supporting those yeah. about the same? No, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. Uh, it, it all comes down to scaling, and, and this is, what, within GEO what we do is, when we put on our products, we, before we do it, we vet them with anybody in the agency primarily who wants to make a comment. And that is one of the comments we heard. Because you can look at it in terms of constant dollars, real dollars. You can, you can have in terms of percent of GDP. You know, you, you, there's all different ways of scaling. And, and we tried all the different ones because we were worried about that very point, that, that we were afraid that we were going to be distorting the story. And it didn't matter how you did it, the, the trends still held up. What they do show, though, is that so far, because because this line 
is going up so much over those 30 years, even though you're getting a smaller share, you're still getting more. But if you're thinking about the lines going down, that's when it's become an issue. So the point you make is a really important one, and that is because it's been a rising tide, it's all boats have risen, but some not so much. But we don't have a rising tide anymore. And now you're going to start to see some sink. That, that's, that's, unless we make some changes. Does that get at you? Yeah, thanks. Uh, Henry Hatcom, research and now. Uh, recently, there's been an article in Forbes magazine concerning uh, the situation in Detroit, which went bankrupt the municipal government. More yeah. recently, I've heard that Bank of America is consolidating their loans and apparently are able to work out something, hopefully. Uh, however, Forbes magazine said the only way to handle a problem like this is to place the municipal employees uh, under Social Security and eliminate these costly pensions and try to have municipal reform. I mean, they could go nationwide try to come up with a new system. Social Security, they said, could go bankrupt. Uh, the time is they don't have enough people in this way. They get more people to contribute. Uh, there's a lot of angles to it all. I wonder how you evaluated this situation. That's a really good question. Actually, about three questions in there. <laughs> the, the, the first one is, have we evaluated it? We have been asked to look at distressed communities. Uh, we have a request right now that's from uh, Congressman Conyers and Congressman Peters uh, both from Michigan, uh, who are also getting co-requesters with us to look at these very issues. Uh, the, the request letter that they sent us was <coughs> focused on Michigan, including Detroit, but, but places like Pontiac, etc., and some of the provisions that are in place in Michigan with the emergency manager law. We don't do such detailed work. If you want somebody to look at Detroit, you should go to the Detroit local auditor or Michigan, the, the Michigan state auditor. But we will look at the concept of just communities in general, which we've agreed to do. Uh, so we will be looking at a number of places to see what kind of drivers are in effect. Uh, this, the second question you have about uh, employees being covered by Social Security versus not, a lot of state and local government employees now are under Social Security. Uh, some of the more tenured ones, just like some more tenured federal, are not. For example, I'm not. I'm, a, I'm under civil service. But, but you know, that's, I'm in a distinct minority. Most federal employees are. Instead of that. So that's not going to be as big of an issue because that's already been swept in. It will be in some cases, yes. And that's when you get in a specific case-by-case -case story. That, 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 so that it may really matter to you if, in your locality, but globally it's not going to be a big driver uh, because a lot of that's happened. Uh, the third one is in terms of the actual pension funding in Detroit. You know, the odd thing about that is, is that we're looking at it preliminarily. It looks like their pensions are fairly well funded, uh, which is a different story then, because you have a, st a place that has really big revenue issues. Uh, it's been borrowing actually to meet its financial needs, and now the banks are not going to be continuing. In some respects, the pension looks awfully attractive because it's the one place that does have a little bit of money. So that's, 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 that's one to watch from a little bit of a reverse story. So I would urge you to keep an eye on what happens with Detroit's public pensions. Do they make the contributions or do they take? Let's see. Does that get at your questions, though? Gotcha, um, so how might the story be different here in D.C. Um, based on their relationship with the federal government? Is it just a different piece of the pie? Yeah, yeah D.C. Is, is, I mean, what you have is, I, I'm giving you a sectoral story. D.C. is somewhat of an outlier because if you think about the property tax issue, for example, the federal government's here. So that skews that. Um, uh, when you talk about your expenditures, D.C. would be pretty much similar, except it's a scale issue because it's a city, state versus a big state. So D D.C. is a unique story. Uh, uh, we have done work, but not recently, on the district. 
our work was back in the old days when DC was financially stressed and the control board came in and, and like that. Um, but we haven't done anything recent. But but it's a it's a it's a different animal. Mm -hmm. Even though it's it's in here, but it's a if you, if you look at it by itself, it's a different animal. Okay. So is there any way to know when those reports are coming out, like the distressed communities or you know other reports that you're working on? Y yeah, um, pro probably the the best thing is to ask us. <laughs> I, I mean, I hate to be glib about it, but but with our reports, what we do is that when we get a request that comes in from Congress, we have more requests than we know what to do with. Um, and so we generally, it takes us a while as a queue. So for example, that, that one I mentioned about distressed communities, that came in in the springtime. And we're now just staffing it now. Uh, and as I mentioned, it generally takes us about nine months, a year, or whatever to do a report. So, some projects are harder than others. I think that one may be harder. So the, the best thing to do is to, if there's a particular area that's of interest to you, you know, if it's in my area, you can ask me. Uh, Chuck Young is our, oops, I don't know Chuck. Chuck is our, uh, handles our public affairs. You can ask them anytime. Uh, we post on the web when, when reports go out. Um, that's, that's probably the best. We're not quick because we, we live in a different world than you do. Um, but we try to be thorough and we try to be accurate. We do too. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, no. <laughs> 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 I was going to jump in. We, we, live, we live in a different we world try. time. Well, okay, I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I agree with that. So thank you for that. But we live in a different world time-wise, but we share the same values of accuracy and yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And that's why it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> okay, what I want to do, I don't know how we're looking for time. Uh, Okay, good. I only have a couple little quick things that I want to cover for you too, because I, I think these are sort of interesting issues. Um, and, and, and I have to apologize. I'm still living on an island time. I've been on vacation. <laughs> so I, I just came. This is my first day back at work. Uh, I have to confess, I didn't realize I'd signed on to do this. I was on vacation, and Chuck said, "Oh, these guys want you to talk." And I thought there was just going to be a little meeting at GAO. And I said, "Oh, sure. You know, I'm sitting on the lab." And then I heard it was this. And I said, "This is even better." So um, <laughs> the, the two things I want to close with are, uh, one is on transparency. And there's been a movement, as you probably know, and this ties in with what Bill was talking about from sunlight, to get information out there for people. Uh, to me, the, the first big step in this was Obama McCain, back when the president was a senator. It was one of the things that they agreed on, <laughs> even though if you listen to the campaign when they ran against it, they didn't agree on a lot else, but they agreed on the transparency, and they co-sponsored a bill that ended up in a thing called USA Spending. Uh, USA Spending is out there. It is a very useful data source of where money goes, but it has a lot of limits to it. Uh, I do think it's going to get a lot better. Uh, the, the two places I think USA Spending is going to get better are, one, we did a review of USA Spending a couple of years ago. We took 100 cases. We found problems with every one of them. Uh, I, we're doing a re-review re now. I think that we'll still find a number of problems. That's what we're paid to do. I think there'll be a lot fewer now. The, the accuracy is getting better. The second is, is that money, as I talked about in grants, goes through many stages. It might go through a state government. They may spend it. They may pass it on to a locality or a nonprofit. It goes through chains. USA spending until recently was only picking up the very first step, which didn't tell you much. Now as it tracks down deeper, it's going to be more useful there too. So USA spending is a good source to think about. The last thing on USA spending before I get off it is USA spending was housed in GSA. It's moving to Treasury, which I think is a very good move. Uh, GSA had it because GSA does procurements and they put up platforms and that's what they do. But they're not the money guys. Treasury are the money people. So the most important thing to accuracy and usefulness of data are that somebody's using them. Uh, what we found with the federal agencies is we said, well, what, what do you do with these data? And they said, we, we make sure they're in there. But we have our own systems to manage by. I think with a move to Treasury, you're going to start to see some changes there. The, the second one is recovery.gov. 
recovery.gov is, I think, something whose time has run, but it's a really good model in terms of data that are useful and that are accurate. Uh, I don't know how much you know about the Recovery Act, but one big piece of it was transparency. Uh, and it was standing up a website that showed who got what, uh, how much money it went up for, and, and what it went for. Uh, the one piece that I think is missing in recovery.gov is, and what good did it do? You can't measure the effectiveness. But as far as tracking the flow of money accurately, it did a fabulous job. It wasn't an efficient tool because what it required was the recipients to report back up. So there's a lot of duplicative work. But, but it's a good source for talking about Recovery Act funds, and it's a good model to follow for ensuring that funds are accurate. Uh, what's coming up now is something called the Data Act, uh, which is it's really not the Data Act because it's the last A in data is Act, so it's like data, but it doesn't sound good. You know, it's the data Act. That is, that, that is a bill that started in the House last year, was picked up in the Senate, and made some progress but didn't make it through that session of Congress. It's coming through again. Uh, and this time, the House and Senate, amazingly enough, pretty much match up with what they're saying. And, and frankly, we're very positive about what uh, is in those bills. Uh, we're going to be putting out a report next week on that. Uh, and uh, there may very well be a hearing that we testify at that, that talks about these issues. Uh, and, and the issues to us are, one, governance, which I sort of talked a little bit about, you know, where you place responsibility. Um, this is a, an issue that we believe you need legislation for because you can have the best intentions in the executive branch and they can do a great job now, but things can change. So you want to institutionalize it, uh, the governance. Uh, there's a thing called the GATT board, uh, which is replacing the RAP board. The RAP board was recovery folks. The GATT board is now the folks going forward. Those are good institutions to look at. What, if you want to see some, some papers that people have done, and some work they've done, they're very good targets for you to think about. Uh, they have, uh, for example, the RAP board has this thing they call the ROC, uh, which is a, uh, a tool for ferreting out fraud, waste, and abuse. It works really well. Uh, the GAP board has put together a plan for rolling out um, greater transparency. There's some papers that you might want to look at their sites to, to see some of those things. One thing that's very important in transparency is that you not only ensure accuracy, but you do it in a way that's not too burdensome to the people. There's a lot of data already that you pre-populate with it. And we see a lot of these going on right now uh, with these two bills. And, and the final thing that we looked at was, well, did you ask people who are going to be using it what works? And, and frankly, um, the legislation builds in the opportunity for stakeholders to have some say. Uh, so for example, we talked to Sunlight about what their views were in, in doing our work. So these are certain things to think about. But I think transparency is one that's going to make your jobs easier. Uh, and it's one that's actually some progress. So, so watch the data acts going forward. Because uh, that's something that's probably going to be considered in this session of Congress. Uh, the, the last little piece that I want to throw out there picks up on some of the bills that near the end. And that is, where does a lot of this money I talked about go today? It goes through grants. There's a lot of ways of putting federal money out there. You can do tax expenditures, you can do contracts, you, know, you can do loans and guarantees. The lion's share of the money is going out through grants that we're talking about to the state local governments. Now, tax expenditures are big in other places, but to state local governments, grants is the big tool. And Bill had it 100% right. There is a lot of flexibility in how you do grants. There's also not as much transparency, hence why transparency is such an important issue. The other piece I urge you to watch is grant reform. We haven't had significant grant reform for probably 20 years. Uh, and we, we did have a bit of a piece called Public Law 106-107 that improved some of it, but it didn't go all the way. But the, the grants is something that is to be watching. For example, on contracts, there's a thing called the FAR, which is the regulations of how you do contracts. There is no GAR. There's no grant companies. There's also a lot of training that's done for contracting officers. 
There is not that type of routine of having a curriculum, of having certification for grant making officers. We just put out a report on this uh, this summer talking about grants training for the grant makers. So, so this is something for you folks to watch. Uh, I believe that there will be some type of oversight that goes on in the Congress either late this year or early next, <coughs> looking at grant reform in terms of, again, making them more transparent, making it easier, uh, making it more professionalized, more standardized. Uh, so that's just something to be thinking about because that's an area that you can follow the money. If you do some of those things, you can follow the money a little bit better. So with, with that, that's about the end of my spiel. We've got some comments and questions more. I've got one, and I'm not sure if you answered it, but you were, we, we know that there is a website where you can follow federal contracts. Is there a specific website that helps you follow federal grants? And I think Bill mentioned one way to do it, which is on his tip sheet, but I wonder if you have an answer. Yeah, there, there really isn't an easy way to do that. That's, that's, that's part of the problem. And that's where some of the issues I talked about will help. I mean, so if, if USA spending gets better, it'll be a good place to track. It will be met, met, put in with contracted money, et cetera, but you will be able to search as to whether just grants. The same thing with the Data Act passes. There'll be better transparency there. Uh, but there isn't one single easy place to do it right now or to do it reliably. Okay. I think it would be an interesting story for somebody to take a look at the Data Act and what's actually in it and what it would mean for journalists and what its chances of passage are and so forth. I think a lot of uh, this community would be interested in that. Yeah, on, on data, the leader in the House is ISA, so it's government reform. If the Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee in the Senate uh, is the counterpart, so that, that bill is moving through that. The major players that we've been talking to are Warner, Carper, Coburn, McCaskill, if I forget something, they'll be upset. Portman has been involved, um, Collins, Lieberman, but now he's gone, so we can forget him. You know, that's when I can forget because he's not here anymore. The others, the others, I think those are the major players that, that we've been talking to. And, and I know some of their staffs are quite engaged and quite happy to discuss them. Other questions? Okay, we are going to take another six minute break and uh, then we'll come back and hear from Kelly Kennedy, um, a very uh, experienced uh, and talented journalist. Thank you.